Dear students, in this lecture we will continue from uh, about bioremediation from the previous lecture. We will start again from the hydrocarbon degradation and then move on to degradation of other xenobiotics. So let us get started. So last time we talked about hydrocarbon oxidation and I went underwent uh, the process from how hydrocarbon turns into an alcohol to aldehyde, acid, then acid and it undergoes beta oxidation. So what is this beta oxidation? The beta oxidation takes hydro uh, is oxidation of hydrocarbon to alcohol and then to aldehyde and then to acid and finally to generation of acetyl CoA. Alrighty, now little bit more information about beta oxidation. It is a breakdown process in which the fatty acids are broken to generate acetyl COA which enter then citric acid cycle obviously. And uh, the beta oxidation works in this way that we process, we proceed from alcohol to aldehyde and it generates lot of water in each step and that is been like here and that is very beneficial for um, uh, life living beings that need water in, our, in water scarce conditions. Okay, now let us look at aromatic hydrocarbons. I have mentioned this before that aromatic hydrocarbons are extremely stable and that makes it really difficult to degrade them because the energy barrier of degrading them is very high. So there are certain uh, enzymes that specialize in degradation of aromatic hydrocarbon and uh, many a times it goes through the catechol pathway. So it makes catechol. So let us explore what catechol is. Because uh, compared to an aromatic compound such as benzene, catechol is easier to degrade. So here we have benzene. Now we will have benzene monooxygenase. So monooxygenase you can tell will add one oxygen. How will you add one oxygen? You will break the bonds here and uh, one double bond will be broken and oxygen will attach to both of them. Now you can see that this is not a very stable position for oxygen to be in. So um, it will accept one hand water molecule and then it will have OH, OH here. Now these bands and this triangle represent their stereochemistry that they are pointing in di different direction because it, it gets too congested if you have OH in the um, neighboring um, carbon atoms in a benzene. Now what will happen is it will turn into catechol, this is catechol which is easier to degrade. So this is the monooxygenase pathway. Now the catechol will will use catechol 1 2 dioxygenase. Now dioxygenase so you can say it will add 2 oxygen. So again here 1 oxygen, here 1 oxygen and these bonds will be broken. So here we have this catechol, catechol dioxygenase. Uh, we do not know about this, it is still hypothetical. We believe this is how it proceeds. But we do know that the bond, this bond breaks and then we have cis cis muconate which is very easy to degrade. Now. Um, Catechol 1 2 dioxygenase enzyme has some very specific genetic signatures. These genetic signatures can be do they do serve as genetic biomarkers to detect the aromatic uh, ring cleavage. Alrighty, now let us look at dioxygenase pathway. So, here you had the monooxygenase pathway. Now, let us look at dioxygenase pathway. So, you have toline. Now, toline means benzene with methane, methyl radical here. Now, because it is dioxygenase, you will have one bond breaking and O attaching to uh, each carbon. So you have this and then uh, eventually what happens is that they um, initially this is what happens and then they make uh, uh, they make a bond again and you have this compound and then it uses the enzyme called methyl catechol 2,3 dioxygenase. So basically this is a catechol, this is a methyl. So this is a methyl catechol and then it uses methyl catechol 2,3 dioxygenase. Now because it is 2,3 dioxygenase the bond breaks there and the ring has cleaved. Once the ring has cleaved, the aromaticity has been lost and this is very easy to degrade. So this is your dioxygenase pathway. Now let us look at the catechol funnel. This is a picture from a um, very old um, book. Um, so here we have um, different aromatic compounds and all of them. So this is a funnel. So we are starting with uh, this uh, anthracene, we are starting with uh, tryptophan, with toluene, with mandalate. So no matter where, or benzaldehyde, wherever we are starting from, naphthalene, they all, benzene and phenol, they all undergo the catechol pathway. So this is where the benzene ring is most vulnerable to cleavage. So that is why microbes want, no matter which uh, benzene form I am starting with or aromatic compound I am starting with, phenanthaline, anthracene, naphthalene, benzaldehyde, we all want to come to a catechol because once we have reached catechol, it is easy to break it. 
Now, there is another which is protocatuate funnel. So, instead of catechol, I mean this is catechol if we hide this uh, COOH here, but if um, there is this is called protocatechoate. So, catechol funnel is not the only pathway for arom degradation of aromatic compounds, but we also have protocatechoate and uh, some uh, aromatic compounds they go to undergo the protocatechoate um, pathway. This is also very easy to degrade. Now, the other pathway is gentisate funnel. So, many other aromatic compounds they undergo gentisate funnel and let us say there is this and then what happens is that they will add an OH here enzymatically obviously and this is uh, this will lead them to the gentisate pathway. So, uh, note that um, different kind of aromatic compounds can either go catechol pathway or procatechoate pathway or gentisate pathway. Similarly, the same compound can undergo different pathways. So, for example, toline is very interesting because it exhibits de de degradation through different pathways. It can undergo catechol pathway where it first makes benzyl alcohol, then the benzyl alcohol is degraded into aldehyde. So, this is beta oxidation benzyl aldehyde and then into acid benzoic acid and then finally into catechol and then you know catechol we can uh, cleave, the ring can cleave easily. The other thing that toluene can undergo is that instead of um, oxygenation of its methyl radical, it can have a breakdown of the bond here and it makes 6 toluene dihydrodiol and then this undergoes, this becomes 3 methyl catechol and then this is also very easy to degrade. Basically a catechol with a methyl radical attached to it. Um, and then toluene, the third pathway that toluene can undergo for clean cleavage is the protocatechoate uh, pathway where it um, adds an OH here in the para uh, position and it, this is cresol, para cresol and once the para cresol has made, been made then the methyl radical can undergo oxidation. So, eventually finally uh, the difference between the first pathway and the third pathway is that even though uh, the methyl radical gets oxidized, here we have catechol forming near the where methyl radical used to be, but this will be opposite from methyl radical. Okay, the OH that will attach to make protocat, this is protocatechoate pathway will the OH that will attach will attach near the para OH. Now the other is instead of making para cresol it might make ortho cresol. So the OH might attach to the in the ortho position and once the OH attaches in the ortho position it again undergoes catechol different kind of catechol pathway. So we have three methyl catechol. So again catechol but the methyl radical is adjacent to one of the OH. So same toluene can undergo uh, pathway degradation through at least four different pathways that are well that were well established way early in 19 um, uh, way early in pre 1970s and 1980s. So notice that there is not just one sure short way of degrading a um, uh, contaminant. There are multiple ways. Each step are enzymatically catalyzed, and there are different microbes that might be expert in undergoing different kinds of pathways. So if I'm talking about okay that I have toluene contamination and toluene is undergoing degradation, I might not only see just benzoic acid, benzyl dehyde, but I might see different forms such I might find paracresol, orthocresol, three methyl catechol. So it doesn't mean that the microbial community is doing weird things, it just means that there are multiple pathways of degradation. Okay, then there are intermediate pathways, let us look at them. Okay, so we are, um, let us say starting here with catechol. Now how the catechol will degrade? There are two ways catechol can degrade. It can either undergo catechol 1,2 dioxygenase, so it will add the oxygen in 1,2 position or it can undergo catechol 2,3 dioxygenase, so in 2,3 position. So if it is 1,2 dioxygenase, then it will add to 1,2 uh, position and 1,2 position means the it will, these OH radicals will get oxidized, the bond will break. Now here you have uh, di um, acetic acid, so this will break into acetyl COA succinate and this will go into citric acid cycle. The other possibility is that the catechol 2,3 dioxygenase enzyme might add oxygen in different positions here and here instead of in these two and as a result we have this, the, but the bond is broken, the ring has been broken. This will turn into acetaldehyde, it will give away pyruvate which will further undergo degradation very easily. We have talked about uh, citric acid cycle and pyruvate degradation earlier, so you must know about this. Now let us look at protocatchuate, so we have protocatchuate here. So basically this is catechol but with the COOH attached here. 
Now this might undergo again 1,2 dioxygenase or it might undergo 2,3 dioxygenase. If it undergoes the 1,2 dioxygenase pathway, the enzyme catalyzing it is called protocatuate 1,2 dioxygenase enzyme. So this enzyme will again in 1,2 position, so these OH radicals will be oxidized into COOH and then they will break down into carbon dioxide, acetyl, COA, succinate and undergo citric acid cycle. On the other hand, the protocatuate might undergo protocatuate 2,3 dioxygenase a pathway in which um, the oxygen, the dioxygen means the oxygen gas that oxygen that will be consumed will attach at 2 3 position, and this is how the ring will cleave. It will make succinic semi aldehyde, then pyruvate, and it will further undergo degradation. Now, let us look at genticide path funnel in genticide pathway how the degradation happens. So, um, in this, uh, the, uh, the uh, this is your uh, starting aromatic compound, and then it breaks here and adds OC, COH and here COH, it may removes acetoacetate and then makes fumarate and fumarate is very easy to degrade. Now these are different PHS, PHS are um, very commonly used abbreviations, so I would like you to be familiar with what PHS are. PHS stand for polyaromatic hydrocarbons. So one benzene ring is hard enough to degrade, correct? We are talking about catechol pathway, protocatuate pathway, the genticide pathway and um, even in cat once catechol has been made, the catechol can undergo 1,2 dioxygenase or 2,3 di dioxygenase enzyme pathways. But now add multiple um, aromatic rings and the re they are resonating together. So the electron cloud for naphthalene for example, for naphthalene the electron cloud moves like this. It is much much more stable than a single benzene. Now degrading this is going to be more tricky. How are we going to degrade these? And look, these are even more difficult to degrade. Pyrene, chrysine, fluoranthine and most of our pesticides, most of our insecticides and many other xenobiotics that are popularly used in our country are PAHs. So uh, the arrows in this diagram are actually showing you the most common sites in which the enzymes attack PHS through aerobic degradation. So note here, until now we have been talking only about aerobic degradation of aromatic compounds. So anaerobic degradation of aromatic compounds looks slightly different. But if you look at the arrows carefully, for example in naphthalene, it is this bond that will be attacked by the uh, enzyme, enzymatic activity for oxidation. In phenanthrene we have three sites, in anthracene we have one site, this is very stable anthracene by the way. Here we have two sites obviously the less resonant one, here also we use this bond, here it breaks this bond because this part is the less, um, has less resonance than this part. In fluorine it can degrade, it can attack this 9 position, it can attack here these bonds. In benzaanthracene it attacks these points. In chrysine, there is only one point where it can attack. In pyrene, it attacks here. In benzopyrene, it attacks the the, uh, the isolated benzene ring. Now, um, another one thing you want to note is that the benzopyrene, benzaanthracene, and chrysine they are carcinogens. So we want them, and most of them are mutagens, teratogens, and they affect human health, environmental health. But benzaanthracene, chrysine and benzapyrene they are carcinogens. So if a human being is exposed to these compounds, we are very likely to get cancer. Now let us look at anthracene. So among these let us choose anthracene. So anthracene is here, 3 benzene ring. So we have anthracene and as the arrow suggests 1, 2, this part is most likely to get attacked by enzymatic oxidation. So this bond gets broken. When this bond breaks, the OH attaches here, one OH attaches here and we have anthracene cis 1, 2 dihydrodiol. And once we have this, the uh, aromaticity changes and it makes a double bond here and um, yeah, so this is what we get. Then this further ox gets oxidized and um, it the, this bond cleaves and this becomes an acetone and we have an acetic acid here, we have OH here. And then this, now notice here we have um, equilibrium, uh, equilibrium, so what basically they are saying is that at times this OH radical will give its hydrogen to this ketone here and then this will become OH alcohol and this will become a ketone. So this is an equilibrium, so sometimes it is in this form, sometimes it is in this form. So basically we can write it like this and then eventually it will break down, it will make two pyrate, it will make pyrate 
once it has made pyrite, um, it will release a pyrite and it will make this. So, this part breaks down, releasing pyrite and then this has to undergo further oxidation. Now, look here, you have two aromatic uh, rings attached to OH and to CHO. So, obviously beta oxidation, CHO will undergo degradation make COH. So, this is naphthalidehyde, this will make naphthalic acid and then this breaks down further and makes salicylic acid. This is also the starting point for making aspirin and then this is degraded very easily uh, onto carbon dioxide. So, this is how bacteria they um, catalyze the metabolism of anthracene. Now, this was this study happened way early in 1965 Evans et al and the microbe that they are this was done in pure cultures. So, in 1965, 1950s, 70s, 80s, 90s maybe even up to 2000 um, most of the biodegradation studies were focused on pure cultures. So, uh, Pseudomonas aerogenosa, one particular microbe in lab, how does it degrade anthracene? Now, again, if you remember, I have mentioned this in the past that an isolated microorganism working in lab might not will show different behavior once it is given, uh, when it is once it is put in environment for various reasons because now it is interacting with the other microbes, it is undergoing competition and its regulation of its um, expression, genetic expression would also change. So, it behavior will change and then it may not be the only microbe that is successfully degrading anthracene. So, we might see different pathways of anthracene degradation, but this is the pathway that was first established. Okay, now, let us look at chlorinated aromatics. So, chlorinated aromatics are again very, very difficult to degrade and uh, until recent past they were the major environmental challenge when we talked about PHS degradation. So, here you have a simple benzene ring chlorine attached. So, what we want to do because the uh, chlorine is very um, strong electron acceptor and benzene cloud is very rich in electrons because they are the pi electrons are happily resonating here. So, this makes a very strong bond between chlorine and benzene. So, the way we want to do is we want to do hydrolysis and we want to remove the chlorine. So, in hydrolytic dechlorination the chlorine is removed by, by, by hydrolysis HCl is generated and OH attaches here and then this phenol is very easy to oxidize. The other is oxygenolytic uh, dechlorination where we directly oxygenate this and then um, one, one OH attaches here, one OH wants to attach here and when the one OH wants to attach here this H and this Cl escape as HCl and we are left with this. And this is also again very easy to degrade. Now, the other thing is we can first break the ring and then dechlorinate it. So, if you are breaking the ring, the oxygen may instead of attaching here and here might attach in this position and in this position. So, in um, when a meta and ortho position, when it attaches there, the this bond breaks and we have this, which is again very easy to degrade. And once this has created, the HCl will escape later. Okay. Now, um, in this slide what I am trying to tell you is that the pathway of degradation matters. So, we have learned earlier that um, same uh, compound can be degraded by multiple pathways, right? We talked about toluene. We also talked about how uh, different um, compounds can undergo different pathways, same compound can undergo different pathways. Now, pathways matter. For example, let us say we are starting with 3 chlorobenzoate. So, this is um, benzoate with the chlorine in the third position, it might undergo cleavage from here and here okay? or it might undergo cleavage like this which is from here and here, here and here. So, uh, depending on whether the OH is attaching here or attaching here, its uh, daughter products would look different. Obviously, if it OH attaches here, then this is what we will have if OH attaches, attaches here instead, then we will have a very different um, structure. Eventually, they end up making a same compound and then they go to TCA cycle. However, once it has reached here in this place, it instead of going through this cycle, it might undergo meta cleavage and it might make a suicide metabolite. This is called suicide metabolite because this will inhibit further degradation. So, it ends everything the cell will die, the micro metabolism would end. So, if instead of letting it go through this pathway, it we allow it to go through undergo this pathway, then this is the end of the story. On the other hand, here also if it undergoes meta cleavage, then um, this is the dead end, this cannot be degraded further, it is very stable. So, the pathway matters. If my, now there are four pathways, two of them very good degradation, one of them is suicide, the other is dead end. 
So, pathway matters. Okay, I have talked about co-metabolism before, so let's look at co-metabolism again. Um, and I have talked about co-metabolism in context of uranium. So, we have uranium and we want to reduce it so that the redu because the reduced form is less mobile, less soluble, but no, um, there is not much energetic advantage for any microbe to reduce uranium. So, we look at microbes that reduce other metals extracellularly like iron reducing microbes and then the enzymes that they use for reducing iron, they can use the same enzymes for reducing uranium. So, now we have uranium um, reduction happening and this is in a way uh, co-reduction of uranium. Similarly, there are compounds that microbes do not want to degrade because it is energetically not favorable and they would prefer doing other things than degrading that contaminant. But if we add some electron donor, electron acceptor that can be utilized by microbes, that can be degraded by microbes or transformed by microbes, then the original contaminant it is possible undergoes co-metabolism. So, let us take an example. So, these are the TCE, TCE is again a very, very contentious and un, uh, contaminant in environment and for many decades scientists across the globe worked very hard on how to degrade TCE. There are two pathways for TCE degradation in theory, one is mono oxygenase. So, there is one oxygen that breaks this double bond attaches here, it makes epoxide, it might undergo isomerization or it might uh, convert into this which is dioxygen which is basically one OH attaches here, one attaches here. So, instead of one oxygen you have two oxygen. So, it might become this and then this can undergo degradation and make glycolic, glyoxylic acid which is very easy to degrade or its CC bond might fragment and it will its bond might fragment and we get formic acid and carbon monoxide. So, theoretically this is how TCE can degrade, but TCE degradation was a big challenge. So, we switched for co-metabolism. Now, how do we do co-metabolism? The essential characteristics of co-metabolism are that the cells will grow on the one substrate, but not the other. So, C is the what will be co-metabolized. In presence of G, C is transformed by non-specific enzyme. So, much like iron uh, reduction, iron reducing enzymes are non-specific. They will reduce any metal that is there in their vicinity and that is why they reduce uranium. So, in presence of G, C will also be transformed by non-specific enzyme produced for metabolism of G. When G is not present, if the enzyme is present, let us say the substrate is gone. Let us say substrate G is acetate. Acetate is gone, but the enzymes that were metabolizing acetate are present, then the C might still undergo transformation. Other thing is that transformation of C requires energy. Transformation of G will give energy. So, if G is not present and cells are trying to transform C because they have enzymes or whatever reason, then we will lose cells if G is not present. The, uh, the other possibility is that uh, when uh, C is oxidized or C is transformed, the daughter products are toxic for the cells. So, cells do not want to do this. In that case, co-metabolism is helpful. And uh, the other thing is that the capacity to get transformed should be there. It should not be recalcitrant. So, typical uh, co-metabolism looks like this. Um, you have your growth substrate, this is your oxygenase enzyme. Okay, and um, you get your catabolic intermediate and your NADPH gets regenerated, you get energy out of it. Now, this is your growth substrate, substrate that gives you food, gives you energy. Now, this is co-metabolic substrate does not give you anything. So, your co-metabolic substrate also undergoes oxygenation. It makes a toxic product, let us say the last point is correct. It makes a toxic product and it stops this. So, at least some of the co-metabolic substrate got de degraded, but after a point the, this would stop. Okay. Now, uh, having talked about biodegradation, I want to talk to you about bioplastic. So, we want contaminants to degrade, but we have certain contaminants that are very hard to degrade like plastic. Now, even though plastic is um, basically a polymer of uh, petroleum hydrocarbons, it is very, very hard for microbes to approach it and degrade it. So, now what uh, scientists in previous few, uh, few years, what they have done is, they have noticed that there are certain bacteria that actually make plastic that actually make um, um, PHAs and PHVs, PHBs and PHVs which make polymers with each other and the polymers are plastic, they behave like plastic. Now, these bacterial plastics are also biodegradable, they degrade really well. So, um, I, in, in the conventional approach we have polyethylene, so polythene and these are just ethyl radicals that are attached to each other and then we have poly polyperpropylene, so this is one CH3 here. And then we have 
PVC, polyvinyl chloride. So, the plastic that we use is mostly either polystyrene used for making clothes, polythene, polyethylene used for making polythenes, polypropylene, PVC used for making uh, PVC pipes, used for making different containers. We have Teflon that is used in um, our cooking ware also and you have polyurethane which has multiple uses. So, these are not degradable. On the other hand, the bioplastic will have a structure like this. So, this is your PHV and this is your PHB. They attach with each other, they make a PHV, PHB uh, polymer and this is one of the shampoo that, uh, that whose container is made by PHV, PB, the bioplastic polymer. So, it looks like normal plastic, behaves like normal plastic, um, but put it in the environment and it degrades like this. So, this is a uh, PHB fork. After 12 days, the microbes have decomposed it this much and after 33 days or 45 days, it is just this and it is going to decay. So, that is why this uh, there is lot of, so there is lot of uh, expectation and hope from the bioplastics that they will help us solve our plastic problem. So, synthetic and microbial plastic, uh, these are the monomers of several synthetic plastic. These are uh, poly beta hydroxy butyrate and poly beta hydroxy valerate and they make polymers together and this is the shampoo bottle. Okay. Now, how are PHBs made? How are poly uh, uh, beta hydroxybutyrate made? So, basically the microbes they use glucose, they use acetyl-CoA, they use different enzymes and then they make uh, monomers of hydroxybutyrate which make poly hydroxybutyrate, beta hydroxybutyrate. Similarly, uh, uh, hydroxy valerate polymer is made and PHB, PHV um, polymer is very nice plastic. So, this is one example of it degrading. And um, who can degrade it? We know that fungi can degrade it, many other microbes, bacteria can degrade it. So, this is not a problem. The problem is we just want to make it economically feasible. All right, dear students, this is all for today. In the next lecture, we will explore microbial communities from uh, other relevant environments and continue our journey on the applied environmental challenges um, and how we apply microbiological techniques to solve them. Thank you very much.